Hello and welcome to the next edition of Cardiac Imaging Agora. In this session, we will discuss tracers and image acquisition for PET and SPECT. This is just a brief overview of the differences and the similarities between the two techniques. What we will discuss in this session are the following topics, cost and availability, tracers, equipment, stress protocols, image acquisition, and image quality. Let's first start with some technical specifications. On the PET side, we have a camera system that's quite expensive uh, in the range of $1.5 to $2 million for a brand new system versus a spec system, which often even with a CT scanner can be purchased for much less. On the resolution side, we have very high resolution on the PET side with four to eight millimeters versus 0.8 to two centimeters on the spec side. For tracers, we use for PET positron emitters and usually we have a single window of 510 keV versus on the spec, we have gamma rays and we can vary the window to accommodate the tracer we're using. On the imaging side, in PET, we use coincidence imaging, and we'll talk about this in the next sessions, and gamma ray windows for the SPECT imaging. The count sensitivity is very important because this will give us more count to deal with, therefore more resolution, more accuracy of the images, and more pleasant images. You can see you have much higher count sensitivity with PET versus SPECT. One of the drawbacks of PET is very short half times for most of the tracers we use currently that are FDA approved versus SPECT where we have tracers in the hours to days, which is translates to higher dose of radiation. As you can see in the next column where PET has much lower radiation in general compared to SPECT. For PET to be performed, the attenuation correction is built in. You cannot perform PET without attenuation correction. For SPECT imaging, this is optional. And the other one is absolute quantification with PET. This is clinically available right now and in clinical use, actually reimbursable in the US as of the beginning of this year, 2020, versus in SPECT, this is mostly in development. Let's start with some of the common SPEC tracers we use. We use usually technetium-based tracers, whether it's MyView, Cardiolite for uh, technetium-based agents, and we use thallium, which is now, its use is becoming less and less common in the US because of its high radiation dose and prolonged half-life and poor image uh, uh, quality with this agent. If we focus on the agents we use more commonly right now with technetium-based agents, these are uh, agents that are synthetic. They emit 140 uh, keV energy, so the window is very clear and sharp. The half-life is six hours and the traditional agents are tetrafosman and systemibi. The top agent here, Technician 99, this is bone scan, this is tech, tech PYP. This is now being used more commonly for uh, diagnosis of TTR amyloidosis. And you can see here, this is a schema or schematic of the uh, radiation or the gamma rays coming from the patient. They go through this uh, uh, filter here, and you can see here very few of these uh, gamma rays uh, pass through this uh, collimator to reach the camera and generate an image before this translates in a very uh, low count statistics. Most of the few following slides, I'm gonna uh, get them from this uh, practice points uh, uh, site on the American Society of Neurocardiology website. These are extremely helpful for beginners as well as for expert users because they will give you a step-by-step -step, uh, guide of how to uh, use these technologies uh, without much uh, uh, deep dive into data, uh, 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 survival curves, uh, p-values, and uh, all these other things. This is very practical, uh, and every practice should probably print out all these uh, uh, practice points and have them as a resource uh, for the practice. They solve a lot of problems very quickly. So on the spec side, these are the uh, a traditional uh, dosage we use. Uh, we use anywhere between eight and 12 uh, millicuries for the rest images. Uh, and then for the stress image, we usually triple that uh, to get uh, to overwhelm the system and get a, a 
few of the stress images. Uh, on the uh, position, most labs perform supine positioning, some labs prone images uh, to avoid the issue of diaphragmatic attenuation. This can be very uncomfortable for patients who are uh, obese, uh, but still is, it is considered if you don't have a CT attenuation correction. The, there is a delay time between the injection time and when you can image so you can clear the GI activity, otherwise you'll be imaging the GI rather than the heart. And that can range anywhere between, I would say 30 to 60 minutes, depending on the type of stress test you can uh, you use. This is the uh, acquisition protocol that uh, most uh, labs use. Uh, it uses a uh, 140 kV window, uh, symmetric over uh, that, uh, that uh, 140 kV. Uh, these are the collimators, uh, and I'm not gonna go over the details of this, this is, can be followed uh, very easily. Most uh, uh, labs use that. And uh, uh, this is, uh, gating became standard in the uh, early 90s and they shouldn't be done, no uh, spec uh, image right now should be done without uh, uh, gating uh, to get, uh, to derive the ejection fraction. Then we move on to the, uh, uh, to the protocols used. This is the most common used, commonly used protocol. Uh, this is a Technician 99 uh, system, maybe or uh, tetrophosmin protocol, where we inject the patient, we wait 30 to 60 minutes, we do the scan. Uh, then uh, there is some delay here uh, between the rest and the stress uh, uh, test. Then we'll have the patient stressed. Uh, then uh, we inject at peak stress. We, de we delay between 15 and 60 uh, minutes to clear the GI. Uh, and then we will uh, uh, image those patients. The uh, uh, image uh, the patients again. So this is the most commonly uh, widely used scan. You can see right here, uh, you can have uh, a, the patients sitting in your lab for about two to three hours uh, before they're done with their scan and uh, uh, door to door. So door in to door out is about two to three hours. Uh, some other uh, uh, labs uh, suggest a stress uh, first strategy. This is uh, uh, a good strategy if you're trying to re uh, reduce radiation exposure, if you know you're dealing with a patient with a normal ejection fraction or no prior history of CAD. Once you have a prior history of CAD or prior MI, this becomes a, a difficult uh, a protocol to apply because you don't know the, def the defects you're seeing as stress are true defects, meaning uh, fixed defects versus uh, uh, reversible defects. So this is, we reserve it often for patients who have no prior history of CAD and a normal ejection fraction. Then we go to some of the uh, uh, other protocols that are less uh, commonly used. These are required a patient to come twice to the site to be imaged. These are two-day protocols. Uh, day one, uh, we do stress. If the stress is normal, we don't bring the patient back. If the stress is abnormal, we bring the patient back for day two. Uh, and uh, some of the protocols uh, here we use with thallium. Uh, our lab has not used thallium in many, many, many years, probably I would say uh, over a decade now. Many labs are moving away from this, but this is available for you if you want to refer to. Uh, and finally, there are some labs that still use dual isotope scan where they start with a rest scan with thallium and they move to a stress scan with uh, technetium. This is a more efficient protocol because you can right away go from the rest images to the stress images. Uh, however, the drawback is the rest images are done with thallium with long uh, half-life and uh, uh, poor image uh, quality. Then we go to the FDA approved PET tracers. I would start with the most commonly used, which is the uh, uh, F18 FDG. This is a cyclotron produced agent. Uh, so it has to be produced on site or a nearby site. The half-life is uh, uh, almost two hours, uh, not, uh, not two hours, but almost two hours. It's a glucose analog, and this is being used uh, predominantly uh, to image hibernation and inflammation. Uh, its resolution is excellent. Uh, uh, we'll talk about that in other sessions, why the FDGS resolution is better than rubidium, but it has to do with the uh, distance the, uh, the agent travels before it annihilates and emits the positrons. Rubidium is probably the most commonly used stress agent uh, with a, a cyclotron. Right now we have, uh, we used to rely on on-site cyclotrons given the short half-life. Right now we have these miniature cyclotrons that have been promoted. Uh, and uh, it, this is a perfusion agent using the, uh, it's a potassium analog similar to thallium, 
uh, it uses the sodium potassium ATPase uh, to enter the cell. Uh, it's been approved since, 19, uh, since 1995. Its resolution is intermediate. And finally, one of the least uh, used agent, and sorry for the typo here, uh, ammonia and uh, uh, 13 ammonia. This has a short half-life. It's cyclotron. Uh, uh, it, is, uh, it enters the cell through a diffusion metabolic uh, trapping uh, uh, pathway. It's been uh, reimbursed and approved uh, since 2003 for clinical use uh, in the US. It's, uh, it has an intermediate uh, resolution. It has other issues, but we'll discuss uh, in specific cases in the future. Now, if we, if we uh, move to the uh, sp specifications of, this, of these uh, things, we talked about this before, but I repeat it here again, just to uh, drill the issues of half-time rubidium versus ammonia, 75 seconds uh, or around 75 seconds uh, for uh, rubidium, 10 minutes for ammonia. This doesn't give you much time to do exercise stress testing here. Uh, so there is no exercise testing with ammonia unless you can figure out how to do a supine bike stress testing uh, with, sorry, with rubidium. With ammonia, you can do a, a stress test if all the stars are aligned. So if the dose arrives where the patient is at peak stress and you rush the patient right from the uh, treadmill, uh, into the camera to be uh, to be imaged. A typical workflow for a PET uh, MPI is the patient will come in uh, and you follow this pathway. Uh, you do a CT scout image, uh, which is called a transmission scan image. Then you inject the tracer. You do the emission images, which are the perfusion images. Right at that point, you do the stress test, which is very often is a pharmacological stress test with ragadenosine or adenosine or dipyridamol. Uh, we have switched our lab to the gadenosine years ago, and we're very pleased with it. Uh, it gives a single dose, uh, not very complicated protocol. And then you go again and uh, re-image the patient, uh, do the CT again, do the emission and transmission images after you inject the tracer, and then you're done. This entire protocol can be done in about 25 minutes uh, total. So the patient is in and out of the lab, door to door in 25 minutes. Very efficient protocol, uh, very reliable, uh, rarely you get in trouble with this kind of, uh, of protocol. Now, if you move to the, uh, to the technicalities of what we do here, again, these are different uh, acquisition modes. And again, this is from the American Society of Nuclear Cardiology practice points. Uh, it depends what camera you have, uh, how you can acquire this. Uh, most of the modern cameras are, have 2D and 3D acquisition uh, ranges. That can allow you to minimize the dose of the agent you, uh, uh, you inject. So most people have moved from 40 millicuries down to 20 or 25 millicuries right now for a rubidium uh, dose. Um, again, we use uh, a, a complex but uh, simplified uh, reconstruction uh, of the uh, reconstruction of the images using filter back projection. Uh, and uh, there are not many really uh, things that can go wrong here except if you have the patient stable on the table and uh, uh, you follow this, uh, this, uh, this protocol. Uh, one of the uh, things about uh, PET once you start using it is to learn uh, how to QA the images and we will do that in the in uh, future sessions. Uh, so SPECT versus PET, as far as the exercise protocol, with SPECT you have true treadmill exercise, it's readily available, you can do true treadmill. This has uh, uh, been used for uh, now three to four decades. With PET, mostly farm protocols, especially if you're relying on rubidium uh, alone. And you can use stress or farm uh, when you're using uh, uh, N13 uh, ammonia, but you need an on-site uh, cyclotron to use, uh, to use that. Now, as far as the quality of the images, this is the same patient uh, undergoing uh, SPECT uh, on the left-hand side versus uh, PET on the right-hand side. Uh, you can see here the problems with, uh, with SPECT or the challenges. You have the diaphragmatic attenuation right here, uh, poor count statistics. Again, very few slides to deal with here because of the limited spatial resolution. When you go to PET, this is the same patient. The issues of uh, attenuation are not there. Uh, we have way more slides, almost double the number of slides to deal with, given the, at least uh, clinically double the spatial resolution. However, you can have a little bit of more of GI activity, especially with rubidium. Uh, that to, to deal with, especially between rest and stress. So this can be the, the drawback. Uh, however, again, uh, just uh, from an aesthetic standpoint, you can see how appealing the, 
uh, and easy to read the PET images are versus the SPECT images. We'll give you another uh, 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 cast or a video on that uh, in the future, uh, comparing the sensitivity, specificity, uh, predictive value, uh, uh, ease of read of all these tests. This is all these all subjects have been studied before, and can, we will share with you uh, our knowledge of these uh, topics in the future. Uh, other applications of PET, which we will discuss separately in separate uh, videos, where one will be the uh, PET for assessment of inflammation uh, for myocarditis and sarcoid and uh, endocarditis, and PET for the assessment of myocardial viability, mainly hibernation, uh, the most commonly, uh, commonly used indication for PET. So the take home messages from this podcast is uh, for cost and availability. Uh, PET is not as available because of the cost issue. Uh, it's way more expensive than spec, at least the initial cost and the cost of, the, of buying a generator or having a cyclotron. Uh, most PET agents are cyclotron uh, generated uh, versus spec, you can have a generator or a unit dose uh, to perform. Equipment, uh, PET and PET CT right now, we rely at, at least our center on a dedicated cardiac PET CT. Spec is a generalized camera adopted for or adapted for, uh, for uh, spec. Uh, you can have it with or without CT attenuation correction. Newer technologies are coming with CZT images uh, and the like. Uh, we will discuss again in future sessions. Uh, for stress protocols with the PET, it's mostly predominantly farm uh, versus spec. You have farm versus exercise. You can do it either way. Uh, image acquisition, uh, a much longer time with spec in the range of two to three hours uh, for to finish a protocol versus PET, under half an hour for a rest stress protocol. Image quality, uh, for sure, PET is, a, is a, in general, has much better image quality than SPECT uh, in all the uh, patients and uh, patients with various uh, body habits. So with that, uh, we'll conclude this, uh, this uh, video session. Uh, we will see you with the next one uh, very soon. Thank you.